I remember. Okay. And um, thank you everyone for joining. So I can see some familiar names now on the, the list of participants. So thanks to those of you who've been tuning in every day this week. Um, today will be the last of this, this week's uh, webinars and then we'll uh, pick up again on Monday with uh, writing and then it'll be over to Bartek for a session on managing stress with young learners and also growth mindset as well. So uh, great things to come next week too. So I've got my presentation and screen already shared. Um, if you can just give me an okay in the chat that you can see everything and you can hear me clearly that I don't need to adjust the volume or anything, then we can get started. I'll just check everything is clear. Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm getting it okay. So um, I'll, I'll move forward then. So just a few uh, pieces of information. As I mentioned, we'll be recording the session. If you have any questions throughout today's session, I won't deal with them um, as we're working through the activities, etc. But I will at the end leave time to deal with questions. So please um, jot them down in the question and answer box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen next to the participants icon, you should see two speech bubbles. So if you can pop your questions in there and we will get back to you um, at the end of today's webinar. The recordings then will be made available at the end of this series and we will make them um, accessible as of the, the 9th of October. So alongside the recordings, which you can access if you've registered for the session, um, you will also receive access to what we call an online goodie bag, which is essentially um, a folder in which we will um, put all the documents, uh, all the brochures, all the test guides, any templates or anything that we're using throughout this series. So you've got in one handy place all the materials um, that you can download from this series. So let's look at the, the, the plan for today. Uh, we're going to start with an exam overview and how to go about planning the session because the success of a PT Young Learners session over and above obviously preparing your students is in the planning of the session itself. Um, particularly because these are not one-to-one -one interviews but they are group oral exams so it's important that as a centre um, and as teachers oral examiners you are prepared to to manage that session then we're going to take a, a deeper look at the task in uh, activity number seven which is the board game and what strategies you can use to help students to make the most of um, their speaking opportunities in that task and then we'll move on to task eight, which is the short talks with, with the topic cards. And again, we'll look at strategies and best practice um, for preparing students for that. We'll round up then with the resources that are available. Um, we have a new course series published this academic year, and there's also uh, an update to the downloadable materials that you can get from the website as well. So just to inform you of what's available in terms of preparation resources. So for those of you who haven't um, seen any of this week's webinars, I just wanted to start um, by just taking a brief overview of um, the whole exam structure. So not just at the speaking, but uh, across all the different skills. Um, this is just to really contextualize where the speaking exam fits in within the rest of the PT Young Learner levels. Um, and as you can see from this grid, um, they are tasks seven and tasks um, number eight. And the task type is the same across all the levels. So um, different to some of the listening, reading and writing tasks, which can vary from one level to the other. The tasks in the speaking exam are the same. Obviously the lexical sets, the grammar range, um, and so forth that a student is expected to know uh, changes from level to level. And also just to point out that um, a springboard exam will take into consideration that students already know 
what's in the content of the first word syllabus as quick march will have springboard so these exams are very much designed to be incremental in terms of developing students um, st students range of uh, range of language so range of vocabulary lexical sets and uh, grammar structures um, and functional language as well so the scoring then of the speaking tasks um, accounts for 20 points of the 100 that are available and they are scored in the same way across all the levels and they're actually scored in the same way um, from one task to the other as well so what the examiner who is marking the student is listening for is the range and accuracy of use of grammar and vocabulary and they're looking for the clarity of their pronunciation as well as um, for the top marks use of intonation and word stress as well to convey meaning um, we'll come to the marking criteria in a moment but essentially for each of the two activities there's a maximum of five points available for the grammar and vocabulary score and five points available for the pronunciation score bringing that to a total of 10 per activity so out of the 100 points available for candidates in the young learners 20 um, are used in the the speaking tasks the way in which um, the, the, the examiner scores students then is through the compilation of a mark sheet and this is the front cover of a mark sheet where you will also have the candidates name, surname, centre number, level of exam date and so on and so forth. Um, but essentially um, the examiner will be asked to complete this mark sheet and as mentioned give a score out of five for appropriate use of grammar and vocabulary and a mark out of five for pronunciation, um, both for the board game and for the short talk. That then bring in a total score that's um, calculated out of, uh, out of 20 available points. The scoring criteria for the Pearson Test of English Young Learners um, again is, is the same scale that gets used. Um, what the examiner needs to be familiar with obviously is what language is expected at a given level because um, particularly for example if you look at the grammar and vocabulary usage in, um, in the, uh, the box for five marks. It says student has excellent range of both vocabulary and grammar used accurately and appropriately. Errors are rare and found only in low frequency lexis when using more complex grammatical forms. So in order to really understand whether an error that a student is made is because they're almost pushing up to the next level and using you know low frequency vocabulary for the level they're in then we would expect the examiner to have a knowledge of what is expected from a grammar and vocabulary point of view at that level to make that judgment i think the important thing to notice here is that um, it does specify that errors are, are rare and found in low frequency lexis and when using more complex grammatical forms. So in essence, we're not expecting a flawless performance from the candidate. It is possible that they make a mistake and still score five points, the maximum score. Um, however, those errors need to be limited um, to, to what is described here so that they're not tripping up on, on very, um, uh, you know, very common um, frequency, um, high frequency lexis and um, common grammatical forms. As we go to four marks then, you'll notice that um, errors creep in uh, a little more often here. So student has good lexical and grammatical range, but there may be occasional errors. So we've gone from errors are rare to occasional, so slightly more often. It may be that one of grammar or vocabulary is a little weak, 
but the other compensates for this and errors do not impede understanding and I think that's a key piece of information so it may be the case that a student makes the occasional grammatical slip or lexical slip um, but not to the degree that that is causing the listener to struggle to understand what the student is saying Three marks then, error in both, errors both in grammar and vocabulary are evident, but the student has enough knowledge in these areas to communicate that there is little or little need for clarification. So this is a student who is tripping up on grammar and vocabulary more regularly during the sample that they're producing during the oral exam. Uh, however, um, it's not to a degree that the examiner needs to ask them to repeat because it's not clear what they're saying. So five marks, four marks, three marks, you see a varying degree of, of errors taking place. Um, but uh, even at three marks, it's not to such a degree that the examiner is struggling to understand what they're saying because the usage um, it is so incorrect that it, it's not obvious what the candidate is trying to say. As I go down the scale then to um, the two one mark and zero marks, um, you'll see at two marks that despite occasional good usage, grammar and vocabulary cho choice is frequently incorrect and causes problems for the listener as well as the misunderstand as well as misunderstandings. So between two marks and three marks, there really is a threshold, if you like, in terms of the weighting of the amount of errors versus the correct usage and the level of effort on the part of the listener to really decode what the what the speaker is trying to say. So once you're you're into a performance from a candidate where the basically the um, the correct usage is is occasional rather than the errors being occasional then you see that um, that, that you're down in the in the two marks category and similarly the the level of effort the need for clarification um, and the the possibility of misunderstandings are much more present for one mark, uh, although there is knowledge of individual items of vocabulary and some grammar, these are so limited that only rarely is real communication possible. So this could be an example where the student is really using odd words to try and communicate rather than um, a sentence, for example. So in a sense, you're having to piece that information together uh, and cannot be considered to be real communication. And then zero marks, no useful knowledge of grammar or vocabulary at the required level. So this is when a candidate really um, is not um, using grammar or vocabulary in a way that's understandable. In my experience, it's rare that students um, who've been prepared well for the exam perform at a two, one or zero mark. Um, bear in mind, those of you who saw the um, webinar on Monday, I talked about the pass rates of PT Young Learner exams and the fact that across all the levels, 84% um, um, has been a minimum sort of pass rate um, of the PT Young Learner. So we do get very high pass rates and uh, generally speaking, if a candidate is performing at a, at a two, one or zero grade, then um, we really question whether they were ready to be entered for, for the level that they've been entered for. So just to bear that in mind. From the pronunciation point of view, we similarly then have a five to zero scale. And for five marks, a student has excellent pronunciation, demonstrating awareness of intonation patterns required for asking questions, as well as of sentence and word stress at, um, and individual sounds. So here, it's quite a kind of a standout performance in a way that um, it's very obvious when a student is not just um, speaking with correct pronunciation, but is going that extra stage and adding intonation, um, maybe pauses for meaning and a, a full awareness of 
sentence and word stress as well. Um, so that's what well, that's what gets a student a, a five point score, a five mark score. If we move to four marks, the student has good pronunciation, which can be readily understood by listeners, despite some lapses in pronunciation, sorry, in pronouncing individual words and problems with stress and intonation. So it, there isn't an effort on the part of the listener to decipher the pronunciation. The pronunciation is good and it's easily readily understood by the examiner. Occasionally there may be some lapses in individual words, so there may be the odd word that's not pronounced correctly. Um, but there may, in, in comparison to a five point score, there may be problems with stress and intonation. So the candidate at four marks isn't putting that extra, um, that extra level, let's say, in by being aware of and using correct intonation patterns and, and using appropriate word stress or sentence stress. For three marks, um, the pronunciations um, can creep in at word and sentence levels but not to a degree where the listener has any great problems. And it may be that the examiner needs to ask for a repetition occasionally, or even a candidate when asking the candidate may ask for repetition. But on the whole, the mispronunciations don't create any great comprehension problems for the, the listener. Moving down to two marks, then you see the frequency of errors in various aspects of um, pronunciation uh, is creeping in here, and um, that can result in misunderstanding or making it necessary for listeners to ask for clarification or repetition. So again, you have that threshold between a three and a two where um, you have some errors, but it's not impeding comprehension. At at two marks, the errors are so frequent that that is then um, requiring the listener to ask for, uh, for clarification and repetition. At one mark, although the student utterances can be recognised as English, they are so difficult to follow that communication breaks down. So it's clear that the student is communicating in English, but um, the pronunciation that is being used is so difficult to, to, to unpick and to understand, then real communication is not taking place. And then for zero marks, pronunciation is not recognised as English discourse. And this may even be where a candidate may try to in some way answer in their own, um, in their own language rather than, than speaking in English, or just that their pronunciation is so difficult to understand that it's not recognisable as English. And again, the sort of the two, one and zero marks are rare where candidates have been thoroughly prepared for the exam. They've had plenty of practice. They've had the language le development work done um, throughout the year and, um, and they've had plenty of practice to, to be able to speak in English. So that's just to make you aware of the, the scale that is used. In terms of planning the session, um, the sessions are available seven times a year um, in the months that you see on the slides here. And something important to note, if this is um, the, the first time you're, you're joining us for training on PT Young Learners, is that the oral exams can be taken up to 15 days before the written exams. So as a centre, you're not obliged to run the oral exams on the same day as the written exam. And actually, I would um, strongly recommend that you consider doing the oral exams on a different day. If for no other reason, particularly if you're doing first words with primary school children, it may actually be the first time that they're, um, they're experiencing formal assessment in this way. So uh, to just break it up and make it more manageable for them, as well as manageable for the school that's planning it as well, um, it's a good idea to, to do the oral exam on a, on a different day if possible. You can organise the oral exam in groups of three to five students because the young learner speaking exam 
um, which is very different in its style to, to many other oral exams, is done as a group activity rather than uh, an, a one-to-one -one with an examiner or even pairs. So a minimum of three students, a maximum of five. Now, obviously, in the current um, in the current situation, our recommendation is that you um, plan for small groups so that you can maintain the distancing and you don't have too many students in the room at once. Having said that, although Pearson uh, is still guaranteeing the availability of exams for those who want to do them, uh, we're very much in a situation where we defer to whatever local and national government regulations are where you are located. Um, the situation with COVID is obviously very different from one country to another and the rules and regulations that are being applied um, are also um, often very different. So our recommendation is that you inform yourself as to what your local regulations are, that you liaise with your Pearson office and if it's okay for you to go ahead and organise an exam session then um, that, that, that's fine, the exam is available, but we, we advise that you do it in smaller groups rather than the larger group of five. The exam usually takes around 20 minutes if you're examining five students, so if you're bringing that down to groups of three it'll take around 12 minutes. But bear in mind that because the exam is recorded, um, you will need to allow yourself a little bit of time just to check um, that the recording has recorded properly and that you can save the, the file um, with the candidate numbers uh, as a file name and you know exactly which candidates that recording refers to. So there is a little bit of um, end of exam uh, piece of work to, to be done by the examiner and uh, as a result if you're uh, involved in running the oral exams or in planning the oral exams we do advise that you leave a bit of turnaround time between one group coming out and the next group going in in order to run the oral exams then um, you need to be an accredited oral examiner and oral examiners are accredited by Pearson um, through um, a multi-level process, if you like. So first of all, there is an application form to be completed, an online application form. If you're interested in that and you're not sure where it is, um, we, we can share that form with you. It should be uh, shared with you by your exams officer, but uh, anyway, we can share that with you. And in order to um, qualify for the training, you need to have a minimum of two years teaching experience. You need to have a teaching qualification, uh, and that can be anything from teacher development interactive to um, a TEFL, to a, a CELTA, to a, a CERT TESOL. Um, if you have any of these qualifications, then you, you can absolutely apply. If you're not a native speaker, you can still apply, um, but we need to have confirmation of your certified level of English. In terms of planning the materials, you need to ensure that you have counters, a dice and an MP3 recorder, um, because the first activity, as I've mentioned, is a board game. You need to ensure that the mark sheets are printed because when you receive the materials from Pearson um, you will get uh, with the exam pack you will get a mark sheet but you won't get printed mark sheets for every candidate that's registered so that's a piece of work that needs to be done before you run the session and I always suggest um, when I'm training oral examiners that they use what I call an assessment grid and I'll show you what that is in a moment um, it's essentially to help you make no, notes about the candidate's performance as you're listening and rather than have to put everything immediately onto the mark sheets it just gives you a chance to note down any particularly um, positive samples of language that you noticed or that you noticed good intonation use of intonation or sentence stress or word stress or whether you noticed particular errors creeping in etc it's just a, a way for you to um, make notes as you're listening 
um, because obviously listening to three different students um, taking part in an activity at once really requires a lot of focus on the part of the examiner. And on the exam day itself, when you're allowed to open the oral exam, you just need some time to prepare the board game. So to cut up the cards, set them out and um, have your counters and dice and MP3 player ready to go. This is what the online application form looks like to qualify as an oral examiner. Um, the first page is very much um, personal, personal data. We ask about um, your English language qualifications if you're not a native speaker and what your spoken level of English is. We ask what your teaching qualifications are and when you obtain that qualification and any other qualifications um, you think are useful for us to know about. And then we ask about your teaching experience. So um, what your current job um, description is and where you teach and whether you're full-time, part-time, and, and so on. So um, it's, it's fairly straightforward in terms of the content of the form. Um, one thing I will mention is that often when I get the applications through for, for Italy, I notice that people haven't checked the drop-down menu of which levels you've taught at. So I often get um, applications coming through that just highlight A1 because that you know the, the other levels haven't been ticked so that's just a, a quick tip in case um, in case that's something that was not immediately obvious and then here is um, just an example of, uh, of the materials that uh, that you will need so we've um, recently produced um, a little oral examiner kit um, and in Italy we'll be sending these out to centres very shortly. They, they've just arrived uh, from, from the UK so you can see you've got little counters there, a dice, um, some pens for the oral examiner to, to mark down the information and, and just like a little pencil case to keep all that in. There's also a, an oral test, a speaking test guide and there are some past paper um, board games for you to work with as well. Just a, a, just a point on the use of the MP3 recorder. So many people ask me whether they can use their mobile phones. It's our recommendation that examiners don't use a mobile phone. And this is as much as anything to do with safeguarding student data. So uh, whereas if the oral examiner is using the MP3 recorder that belongs to the centre and that is immediately handed back to the exams officer, then that's a far more um, secure policy for managing student data. If a teacher is leaving a, a, an exam session with recordings of the students on their own personal mobile phone, then that from our perspective is something to be absolutely avoided. So our re strong recommendation is that the centre um, get some MP3 recorders. They're not expensive um, and then they're, they're sort of centre property if you like and the exams officer can download the files um, store them securely on the on the secure storage on the computer and then delete them from the actual mp3 player. This is then what the overall mark sheet looks like. Um, I, I'd showed you previously just the part where you fill in the scores but there's also all the um, just the general information. Um, I suggest that this gets completed um, in advance of the session so that um, when the examiner sits down um, they, they've, got the, they've got the details already completed and they can just check it as they're asking the candidate number um, of, of, the, of the, the candidate, their name and surname etc. So the examiner will need to complete this form putting in the scores out of five for each of the four uh, different parts and they'll give the total and they'll need to sign it okay so only authorized examiners um, with their examiner code can actually uh, run an oral exam this is the assessment grid i was talking about so um, rather than have 
uh, three, four, five of the mark sheets on the table with you, as well as the board game, as well as the MP3 player, the counters, all the um, children sat around, etc. Um, my suggestion is, and I've certainly used this over the years, is to use this assessment grid, which we will share with you in the, in the goodie bag, um, where you can basically put the names of the candidates down um, the left-hand side, and you've just got um, you've just got boxes there for each candidate that allow you to just maybe take notes on anything particular that strikes you about their performance, both from a grammar and vocabulary perspective and a pronunciation perspective. So if you notice, for example, um, with, the, um, with the pronunciation that there, there is, you know, good use of intonation, um, if you notice with the grammar that they're using more complex structures, then it's just easy to note it down next to the candidate name in the relevant box. So when, when you're scoring those students and you need to score them in real time, you've just got you know, some examples that just consolidate in your mind that you are choosing the, the correct uh, score according to the assessment criteria. I just find that a lot easier to manage all on one page rather than have four or five pages on the go at the same time. So let's have a look then at the board game itself. Um, as you can see here, they arrive on A4 cards that need to be cut and prepared. And what this activity is really assessing is um, students' ability to ask and answer short questions about personal information and general interest topics. So it, it's limited in, in what it's actually assessing, but we need to ensure that the student is able to clearly ask the question that's on the card and that they give a complete answer. So in terms of setting this activity up, then the examiner obviously needs to set up the board game. The first candidate will then roll the dice and move um, the appropriate number of squares. And once they land on their square with a question, the examiner will direct the candidate to address the question to another candidate and they will both be referred to by name. This is because, as you remember, the exams are recorded. So it's very important for our moderators in Pearson in the UK where the recordings are sent that it's really clear uh, which candidate is speaking at which point. So the examiner needs to signpost, if you like, um, who, who is asking and who is answering. So the candidate reads out the question and the designated candidate will answer it. After that, that square is turned face down and it's removed from the game. So the turn then moves to the next candidate. And um, when I run the e exams locally, I generally start with a candidate on my left and work in a clockwise direction for the first round of questions. And then I'll finish up um, where I finished up with the candidate on my right. That's where I'll start for the second round. And what you do by going once clockwise and once on anti-clockwise is that each candidate is asked and answers the question of a different candidate on each occasion. So you don't in any way unduly advantage one pair of candidates over another, if you like. So there's always a chance that um, everybody has a more equal experience of the exam. When candidates move their counters around the board, they must count in English. That is part of what is um, being considered. So important um, when you're preparing your students and training them that they do count out the squares in English. The test from this um, activity's perspective is finished um, once at least two questions have been asked and answered, and it shouldn't take any longer than uh, 10 minutes if you have a group of five candidates. So essentially it's two minutes per candidate. If you have three candidates, it'll be around six minutes. And what we bring into this activity is very much um, sort of collaboration, flexibility and communication skills, because 
there is a sense of collaboration between the students in terms of the uh, turning to ask a question and answering another person's question. There's flexibility because you're, you're changing the direction in which those questions are asked each time. And obviously they're putting into practice communication skills. So I'm going to quickly show you um, a video of this part of the exam taking place. Um, I'd be interested to, uh, if you have any comments or observations as you look at this, and then I'll give you my observations when the, um, when the video is finished. So bear with me a second and um, just thinking actually, I have a doubt that I shared the, um, the volume of the computer with uh, this. Let me just come out one second and reshare. One second, let's... Um, here we go, that's it. Just to be sure you can hear. Hello everybody. Hello. Hi. My name is Kasia. We're going to play the board game and then we're going to do the short talks. Um, Kuba, can you please choose a counter? Red. Batek? Red with stripes. Okay. Victoria? Yellow. Hmm? Olivia? Blue. And Anna? Green. <laughs> Start the board game. Anya, you're first. Roll the dice. It's five. One, two, three, four, five. And ask Olivia. What was the weather like yesterday? Yesterday was hot and rainy. Hmm? Olivia, it's your turn. Two. One, two. And I have How much homework did you do yesterday? Uh, I did um, Polish homework. Victoria, it's your turn. What time do you go to bed in the school holidays? 11 p.m. Perfect. Here you are. Roll the dice. Okay. And... I have three. One, two, three. Which are better? Winter holidays or summer holidays? I think summer holidays are better. Okay. And Kuba, roll the dice, please. One. And ask Anya. How many times a day do you brush your teeth? Um, I brush my teeth three times a day. Okay. Just give a minute or so. I'd be interested to see if you have any observations or comments on the on the video. Anything in particular you might want to ask about or any any observations Anything, anything at all? No? Well, maybe this is quite, quite new to you. So I'll just maybe share some of the things that I notice. I think, first of all, the examiner has a, has a very nice style with the students. Um, you notice here that they're actually doing the exam sat 
uh, sat on the floor on uh, on carpet tiles, if you like. Um, there's nothing in the um, in in the regulations that requires you to sit around a table. So that's you know up to the test centre. Um, as I mentioned before, it would be our recommendation that the students are very well spaced out and that you limit it to groups of um, groups of three. So hopefully you noticed that. Um, once the candidate had asked the question, um, they then turned over the, the card and so nobody uh, fell in the trap of asking a, a question that had already been asked. Um, you'll notice as well that some candidates gave full sentence answers, some candidates just gave a, a word. Um, obviously, um, they're being asked a question and they need to answer the question, but in, with, within reason, it's always easier for an examiner to uh, grade a student when they get as much of a sample of language as, as possible in a sense. If I were to notice anything in terms of pronunciation, I don't think there was anything within that pronunciation that really required a huge effort uh, on the part of the listener. However, there were occasions where, for example, when one of the candidates was counting, he said three rather than three. Um, so just the odd things like that, but certainly I think the level of these candidates was very good. I also noticed that, for example, the third candidate um, uh, was asked a question, I think it was, uh, how, how much homework um, did you have to do? and her her reply wasn't really an answer to the question so when you're preparing your students really um, focus them on the type of answer that is expected depending on what the question word is so whether it's a what question whether it's a how whether it's a how often uh, when etc and and that will vary uh, as will the the lexical sets etc according to the level but just to really pay attention to the um, to the question people often ask me what happens when a candidate um, a either can't read the question because for whatever reason they, they can't read it or b if the candidate who needs to answer has not understood so if i just take those one at a time if the candidate cannot read, um, obviously bear in mind that particularly with first words, children can be a bit nervous, so it can just take them a second or two. Just because they're hesitating and looking doesn't mean they don't know um, how to ask the question. So we just need to ensure we're patient. But if it becomes clear that they don't know how to read the question, then the examiner will intervene and read the question for the candidate. If the candidate who needs to answer hasn't understood, you can ask the candidate who's asking the question uh, to repeat it. And if it's still not clear, then the examiner can um, ask the question. So it's important that the candidate who's answering is not disadvantaged because the candidate who's asking either can't or is not, or not pronouncing the, the question clearly. Uh, so that's something to bear in mind. The other thing to bear in mind in terms of managing the exam is that it's really important if a candidate doesn't understand that they don't just reach across and pick up the card themselves and read it to themselves and answer the question in that way because this is not a reading comprehension activity. It's a speaking exam and we require the candidate to answer a question that is being asked of them orally rather than reading it and, and understanding it and then answering it from having read it rather than listen to the question. So hopefully that gives you some clarity on potential situations that could um, that could move forward. Okay, let's have a look then at some of the um, strategies. Well in terms of working with the board game it's really very much practice in, you know, on, on the different types of questions and on the lexical areas and, and really working on as many different types of questions and as many of the past papers as possible to familiarise students with the types of questions that could come up. But I find that over and above that, when students really kind of engage with this task by, for example, giving them the lexical sets and working with them to create their own questions for those areas, 
and creating their own board game cards, they really get into the spirit of it in a, in a different way. So you can encourage them to write their own questions and add a, add a little picture and they can then become, you know, the, your own class board game, if you like, that you can use um, in groups, depending on the size of class and, and how you want to organize that. But you kind of build up some classroom resources for yourself at the same time. The other thing um, that I often notice as an examiner, this is very much pertinent to first words, is when students can kind of hesitate in that moment of reading what's on the dice and remembering to count out the numbers um, in, in English. So one of the things that um, you can do is to create um, the, the dice um, face uh, bingo cards if you like so you can call out the numbers and the the young learners kind of cross off the the numbers by you know just looking at the dice face and interpreting it quickly and the candidate or the the student who gets to bingo first can then read out their numbers so that could be something that you could do just to get them really um really familiar and that they're not just hesitating on the um on the sort of reading the the dice face i think it's important to remember with young learners that um, they can be quite sort of you know anxious and tense when they come in but generally speaking once they start to engage in that game they do relax because rather than being in a one-to-one -one interview situation they're with their friends and they're, they're essentially playing you're not in any way quizzing them if anything they're, they're asking the questions to each other so from a best tips, uh, best practice tips point of view, um, if students are spaced far apart because you need to maintain social distancing, you as the examiner can move the counter for them, but they must count the number of squares and they must throw the dice and therefore lead you to move the, the counter. So they call out the number and you move it along rather than you're moving it and they're trying to keep up with them. They should be leading the activity. Um, a candidate who answers the question, um, as I mentioned, must not read the question card um, if they don't understand. So they must listen to the question from the candidate who rolled the dice and answer it. They mustn't under any circumstances pick that up and look at it themselves. That's also something to be aware of when, for example, um, if you've got the candidate on your left and the candidate on the right has thrown the dice and they've just thrown a, a number one. So the square is right under the, the nose, if you like, of the, the candidate who needs to answer then again, it's important in terms of how you just logistically manage the room that um, that there's not that sort of, you know, just looking over and reading rather than listening to the candidate who's asking. And the other thing is just to ensure that candidates are speaking clearly. You'll have the MP3 in the centre, um, but it, it is really important that students speak loudly enough because they can sort of, some of them can have quite quiet voices. So we need to be sure that they, they pick that up on the, on the recording. Task eight then is the short talks and students will pick a card at random and talk about it for about one minute. And then the other candidates in the group will take it in turns to ask them questions about their topic. Um, that last line there about their topic is an important one to remember. Oftentimes what happens is candidates put their hand up to ask a question and then ask a question on something completely um, and related to the topic. Um, so when we're preparing our students, um, we can work with the topic cards and it's a good idea to start um, scaffolding the kinds of questions you could ask uh, around a topic card. Another thing that can typically happen um, in, in the um, topic card activity, which is there to um, assess their ability to speak about a topic of personal interest and answer questions and again they'll be assessed on their grammar and vocabulary but oftentimes whoops, what can happen is that students will run out of things to say very quickly 
and we'll look in a moment when we look at the, the strategy and, and best practice, what we can do to avoid that happening. But first, let's have a, another look at the, the group of um, candidates here and let's look at how the topic card activity works in practice. going for some reason let's try it again bear with me a second seems to be okay now going to do the short talks here are the topic cards Can you start? Choose a card, please. What's your topic? Some of my friends. Okay, so um, I tell you about my friends from your side. Um, my first friend is uh, Summer. Her name is Summer, and uh, she's ten. She has got uh, long brown hair and blue eyes. Uh, she likes bananas, but she hates pineapples. Uh, she can do air yoga and she can dance. And she can skate or swim. Uh, Casey is 10 too. Uh, she's friendly and clever. Uh, she has got long brown hair and green eyes. Uh, she likes apples. She can swim very well and uh, she can't dance. Thank you. Has anyone got a question, Joanna? Olivia? How did you meet your friend Summer? Oh, uh, I met Summer uh, when I was uh, rollerblading in the park uh, and I had an accident and Summer helped me. Victoria, mm -hmm. what do you uh, do? What do you like uh, with Summer? Um, uh, we like uh, dancing and singing. Uh, yeah, I miss. Patek, what did you do with your friends? Uh, we go uh, to the cinema <clears throat> uh, for some musicals, and then when we uh, we are walking uh, to the place that my parents my, uh, will uh, wait for me. Uh, we dance and sing together. And one short question from the um, When did you meet your friends? I met my friend like a um, year ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you made it here. Okay. So you see they all had uh, relevant questions to ask there. Uh, a couple of them asked the question in the past tense, but um, the candidate gave very full answers, I think, to all of those questions. And the important thing was that they all were very willing to engage with our asking questions. And to that point, I did just want to highlight that should a candidate um, give quite a short and limited performance when talking about their own topic, there is a chance that they will, um, let's say, recoup um, their, their overall performance if they're very engaged in asking the questions to the other candidates. So it's not just what they say about their own topic, but their ability to ask questions and their willingness to engage in that process. So one of the things that um, I like to do for building up candidate confidence with the topic cards, because 
what I have seen happen in the past is candidates come to the exam, choose a topic card and actually start to describe what they see in the picture rather than just talk about the topic in general. So with a mind map um, activity that you can um, literally put any of the, um, the, the topic cards at the center of that, you can start um, to build and scaffold candidates performance by getting them to think about what questions can they ask themselves to actually build out what they're going to talk about. So in this particular instance where you've got my family at the weekend, um, you might want to talk about who within your family are you going to, to refer to and talk about. What do you do with those members of the family at the weekend? Where do you go, for example, with them and things you like or you don't like? So that's a very simple example. But once you start to build that approach with students, obviously the goal is to get them to a, a stage where they're not then relying on a worksheet with a mind map, um, but they're actually visualizing some things that they want to pick on to give a rounded description. It's surprising how much more they can say about the topic than just looking at the picture and just it's trying to build that from scratch without any kind of framework to, to rely on. So important that they're familiar with what the task requires. And as I said, they don't simply describe what's on the picture that you scaffold the questions. Um, they can ask each other about the topic by initially giving them questions to ask and then gradually moving to a mind map where they need to think of questions and as a final step to do that activity without the mind map, but to, to you know, use it as an approach that they can rely on. We're almost finished, so I'm just gonna spend a few minutes on the resources. On the PT Young Learner website, and we'll share this with you in the online goodie bag, there are the um, teacher's guides, um, which give you an overview of the format and content within the exam, the scoring and the, um, the, lexical, um, the lexical sets and the grammar structures that students need to know. You can download editable past papers from the website or just um, just simple past papers um, and that includes both the written test and the oral test. There's also the recordings for the listening activities. Uh, Team Together is our five level primary course that is correlated to the PT Young Learner exams and each level there's um, one of the levels, I think is level three, um, sort of goes between the quick march and the, uh, and the breakthrough. It, it, it builds um, it builds on both levels, but you've got task types from PT General within the course and then you've got um, the specific practice test books with uh, language practice activities and task types from the exam. And on the Pearson English portal of Team Together, you've also got downloadable past papers that you can access there as well. So over and above uh, a front of class tool. So if you find yourselves doing lessons on Zoom or whatever with young learners, then you can present the, the pages of the course book on screen. Um, but you've also got a whole host of teachers resources there that you can download and share with your students as well, including the, the past papers. If you have any particular questions that you want to ask, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm just checking the Q&A box and I can't see anything. Um, Bartek, I don't know whether you've picked up anything throughout the No, there, there were no questions in the chat or Q&A. Okay, so I'll just hang on a, a minute or so and um, while I'm just waiting to see if there are any questions that people want answered. Uh, thank you for, for attending. Thank you very much.